So I hope you've got your notes printed or at least some papers so that you can go through and go through the journal entries with us as we walk through the entries from the perspective of the seller. So in learning objective two, we bought the inventory. We have it recorded at cost now in our books and our asset account. And now we're ready to sell the inventory using a perpetual inventory system. So we talked about this in learning objective one. Remember that when we are selling a good, we're going to call that account sales revenue. And we also talked about how every time we sell something, we have to do two journal entries. The first entry is to record the sale. The second entry is to record the inventory that we sold. So we need to reduce the inventory account and move that amount into that cost of goods sold expense account. So here we're told we sold two tablets for $1,000 cash. So each of the tablets has a $500 selling price and the two tablets together total $1,000 cash. And remember from learning objective two that the tablets each cost us $350. So the selling price is 500. Let me circle that here. The selling price is 500. Our cost is 350. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, but wait, didn't we get a discount? Um, it wasn't exactly 350. And to that, I would say, if you were thinking that, you are correct. In chapter six, we're going to learn how to really determine this 350. So for this chapter, we're just going to assume it's 350 and we're going to go with that and we're going to kind of ignore that discounted amount for right now but when we get to chapter six we'll learn how to really determine this so the first entry is to record the sale we actually learned this journal entry way back in chapter two remember anytime we sell something we want to credit that revenue account revenues are always 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 credited so in this case we'll credit sales revenue Anytime we credit a revenue, we really only have two options for the debit. It's either cash or accounts receivable. So in this case, we're told that the customer paid cash. So we'll debit cash, credit sales revenue for the $1,000 selling price. That's the total sales price for the two tablets. Then we want to do that second entry to reduce inventory. Remember, inventory is an asset and assets have a normal credit balance. So to reduce the, excuse me, assets have a normal debit balance. I said that backwards. Inventory is an asset and assets have a normal debit balance. So to reduce the inventory, I want to credit inventory. And then I want to debit my expense account cost of goods sold. Remember, expenses are always, always, always debited. Now, this entry is for the cost, for our cost. The tablets cost us $350 a piece. We sold two of them. So two times $350 means that we're this entry is going to be for $700. So we look at our T accounts here, we've reduced our inventory account, and we've increased our cost of goods sold expense account. Now, I mentioned this earlier in learning objective one, but if we accept a credit card, we're going to still call that a cash sale because we are so 100% certain that we're going to get our money from Visa or MasterCard or whoever that we just, and we're going to get it really quickly. Visa and MasterCard process those. If we're, if you're a large merchandiser several times a day, even if you're a small company, it's the next day at most so we're going to get it so quickly and we're so confident we're just going to go ahead and call that a cash sale now we do have to pay a fee for those so if we sold something let's say for that thousand dollars we're not going to really get a thousand dollars from the credit card company they're going to charge a fee for the privilege of accepting their credit card um I've been told that those fees can be as much as 5%, which if you're a small business is fairly significant. Um, so we may get 900 and, you know, something dollars, but not quite the full thousand. So let's say that we sold five tablets on account for $500 each. 
remember we sold these on account now we're the seller so this would not be accounts payable this would be accounts receivable remember accounts receivable and revenues always go together so we would debit accounts receivable credit sales revenue for twenty five hundred dollars that's the five tablets times five hundred dollars each and then we're going to do that second entry to debit cost of goods sold credit inventory for the cost so 350 times 5 is how we get this 1750 here now notice that just like we did with the accounts payable we said accounts receivable dash pendleton dentistry this is because or again we'll talk about this more in chapter eight but just like before we have really have a separate accounts receivable account for every customer that owes me money now it's possible or it's going to happen that our customers may want to return something to us so this is called a sales return when we're the seller it's a sales return under those revenue recognition standards that we talked about um, earlier in chapter three companies that accept returns so if you're a company that just doesn't accept returns you don't have to do this but if you're a company that does accept returns when you do your closing entries when we do those adjusting entries that we learned back in chapter three we have to do an entry to estimate how much sales returns we'll have we also have to estimate how much inventory we'll get back in sales returns. So a couple of new accounts that we're going to see is estimated returns inventory. This is an asset account that's going to show the amount of inventory that we expect that we're estimating to be returned to us and then refunds payable since it ends in the word payable. It's a liability account, which is the amount of refund money that we are estimating we will have to pay out in refunds over the next year so we're told that we estimate that approximately ten thousand dollars of refunds will be paid out next year and that about six thousand dollars of inventory will be returned so we're going to do a journal entry and to debit that returns inventory and credit that refunds payable so or we did one last year when we did those adjusting entries so here we're told on june 22nd we had a customer that returned merchandise to us they had paid with cash so that means we're going to give them cash back the inventory had a sales price of 2000 and a original cost of 800 so since we have to do two entries when we sell the good, we have to do two entries when it is returned. So the first entry is to give the customer their money back. And then the second entry is to put the inventory back in our inventory account and take it out of cost of goods sold. So since the customer paid with cash, we're going to give them $2,000 cash back. So if we're giving cash away, we're decreasing our cash account. I need to credit cash to decrease it. So I'm going to credit cash and I'm going to debit that refunds payable account, that liability. So I'm now reducing that liability. Remember, I had credited it for 10,000. So this was my estimate. Now I've given away two, so I've reduced my estimate. If I guess exactly right, that refunds payable account will be zero at the end. And now because I'm taking the inventory back, I'm going to debit inventory to put it back in my asset and I'm going to credit that estimated returns inventory to take again. That was my estimate of how much I thought I was going to get back. So now I'm crediting that to reduce that asset. Again, if I guess exactly right at the end of the year, this will all zero so now when I look at those refunds payable T accounts, I thought I was going to have to pay back 10,000. So far I've paid back two. So now I think there's another 8,000 that I still have to pay out in refunds. I thought I was going to get 6,000 of inventory back returned to me. So far I've had 800 returned. So I still think there's another 5,200 of inventory coming back to me. Again, if I guess exactly right, then at the end these will zero out. 
chances are I'm not going to have guessed exactly right and that's okay I'll make an adjustment next year when I do that adjusting entry again now a sales allowance happens if a customer wants to return something to us and I say no you can go ahead and keep that and I'll just give you your money back right so a lot of times I don't know about you but this has happened to me with Amazon I've ordered something from Amazon it came in it was defective or damaged or whatever I went to return it to them and they said you know what just keep it and we'll give you your money back like it was gonna cost more for me to ship it back than the item was worth so that's called a sales allowance when we have a sales allowance it's just like a sales return except that we're not getting the inventory back so we only do that first entry so here we're told we granted a hundred dollar sales allowance for goods that were damaged in transit to Pendleton dentistry so they had purchased on account and their account remained unpaid so when I sold to Pendleton remember I debited accounts receivable and credited sales revenue now that they're returning it I'm going to debit that refunds payable but instead of crediting cash I'm going to credit their accounts receivable I'm gonna say you know what you owe me less money I gave you a hundred dollar allowance so instead of owing me twenty five hundred dollars now you only owe me twenty four hundred so I've reduced Pendleton's accounts receivable and we can see here that their new balance is twenty four hundred dollars now when the customer then pays me when Pendleton pays me I'll debit cash and credit accounts receivable to show that their account receivable is now zero they don't owe me any more money now just like we were offered a discount we may choose to offer our customers a sales discount for early payments so we say you know what you owe us twenty four hundred dollars if you'll pay us within 15 days we'll give you a two or three percent discount that's called a sales discount now those new revenue recognition standards said hey if you're going to offer customers a sales discount then really you should expect the customer to pay at the discount amount so if we offer customers a discount that means that up front we have to record the sale at the discounted amount we can't record it at the full amount and then take the discount out when they pay it we used to be able to do that but we can't anymore so for example here we're told that we sold 15 tablets for $500 each on account with terms 210 net 30 and those 15 tablets have a total cost of 52.50 so if I'm selling 15 tablets at $500 a piece that means the total sales revenue is 15 tablets times $500 $7,500 now since I'm offering them credit terms 210 net 30 that means I'm offering them a 2% discount if they pay within the next 10 days otherwise the entire 7500 is due in 30 days I don't really expect for them to pay me the full 7500 I don't expect that I'm going to get the full amount because I'm offering them this discount now the rules say you have if you do it for one customer you have to do it for everybody there's also a principle we're going to talk about in chapter six it's called the conservatism principle that says you never want to be you never want to overstate revenues or assets you never want to understate expenses and liabilities it says you never want to be too optimistic right so even if I think that this particular customer isn't going to pay me until at 30 days and I'm gonna get the 7500 that's being optimistic the pessimistic which is what kind of the conservative estimate and conservative has nothing to do with how you vote in accounting the conservative estimate says look the most I'm expecting to collect is the discounted amount so that's what I have to record it at up front 
So since I'm selling, since the total sales revenue is 7,500 and I'm offering a 2% discount, I've got two options here. You can multiply the 7,500 by the 2% to get the discounted amount, or you can multiply the 7,500 by 98%. If there's a 2% discount, then that implies they're paying 98% of the bill. So if I do that, that gives me 73.50. So I'm really only expecting to collect 73.50. So when I do my journal entry to debit accounts receivable, because this is on account, debit accounts receivable credit sales revenue, I'm just going to do it for the $73.50. And then my second entry to debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory for the $52.50 is just the same entry that I've always done. But notice that my first entry has to be recorded at the discounted amount. Now, assuming the customer pays within the discount period, they're going to write me a check for $73.50. I'm going to debit cash and credit accounts receivable for $73.50, and their account receivable is zeroed out. I've got my money. Everything's all good to go. But what happens if the customer doesn't pay within the 10 days? Let's say they pay late. Then they owe me the full $7,500. So in that case, what I'm going to do is when I get their check, I will debit cash for $7,500. I will credit accounts receivable. But remember, their account receivable T account only shows $7,350. So if I were to credit it for $7,500, that would look like they had a credit balance, like they had overpaid me, that I owe them money now. I don't owe them any money. I want to zero their account out, but I don't want to more than zero it out. So I'm going to credit accounts receivable for $7,350. So we know that debits have to equal credits, and in this case, I have debits of 7,500 and credits of 7,350. So I'm missing a credit of 150. This credit is going to a new account that we're just now learning called, let me erase this and I'll pull it up, Sales Discounts Forfeited. Okay, so this is a new account. Now, sales discounts forfeited is an interest revenue account. You need to write that down, star, highlight, underline it. It's an interest revenue account. What the FASB said is if you are offering customers a discount, really what you mean is you expect them to pay, in this case, within 10 days. If they don't pay within 10 days, I'm giving them longer than normal to pay. That means the extra they pay me is really interest. And so I have to call that interest revenue. So that sales discounts forfeited is really an interest revenue account. That's going to become very, very important when we get to learning objective five. So I really do want you to write that down, star, highlight, underline it in your notes. Now, we paid, we offered our customers free shipping, which means we know shipping isn't free, but that just means we paid the shipping. So we paid $30 to ship the customer the goods to the customer. So we talked about this back in Learning Objective 2. When I pay the shipping company, I'm going to debit a delivery expense account. Sometimes you'll see it called freight out. Sometimes you'll see freight out as the actual account. Sometimes you'll see it called shipping and handling expense expense or shipping expense, but whatever it, it, it is, it is an expense to the seller. And then we'll credit cash or accounts payable depending on how we paid for the shipping expense. 